the more we are inflamed, the higher level of inflammation in our bodies from eating things like gluten, from having higher blood sugar, for example, the less able we are to access that more sophisticated part of the brain that allows better decision making, and the more we act impulsively and eat the wrong foods and decide not to exercise. Hello and welcome to the Ultimate Health Podcast, episode 273. Jesse Chapp is here with Marnie Wasserman, and we are here on a weekly basis to take your health to the next level. Each week, we will bring you inspiring and informative conversations about health and wellness, covering topics of nutrition, lifestyle, fitness, mindset, and so much more. It's Christmas Day, and we want to wish you a very Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Maybe you're traveling to see family and friends. This will be perfect to take in the car with you and listen as you travel. And this week, our featured guest is Dr. David Perlmutter. He's a board-certified neurologist and four-time New York Times bestselling author. He serves on the board of directors and is a fellow of the American College of Nutrition. David received his MD degree from the University of Miami School of Medicine. He's been interviewed on many nationally syndicated television programs, including 2020, Larry King Live, CNN, The Today Show, Oprah, and The Dr. Oz Show. I'm so grateful to have Dr. Perlmutter on the show. I've been following his work for so long, and as someone that follows a grain-free diet, his principles just make so much sense to me, and they wouldn't have made sense to me many years ago when I was eating a grain-based diet, and I was even eating a lot of gluten, and those foods are just so far gone from my diet now that I don't even miss them. So I'm really excited for you to learn the science behind why gluten and grains are affecting your health and your gut health. And you're also going to learn what keto cycling is, how to keep plants at the forefront of your diet, understanding where all the hidden sources of gluten can be lurking, how type 2 diabetes increases your risk for Alzheimer's disease, how cholesterol benefits your brain and we need to look at cholesterol as our friend, not our foe, what coffee fruit extract is, the role that exercise plays in brain health, so much juicy information. You guys are going to learn so much about grains and your brain. I hope you're ready. Here we go with Dr. Perlmutter. Hello, David. Welcome to the podcast. It's great to have you on. Well, I am delighted to be here. Thank you. We're so excited. This is such an important topic for us. It's been a very important topic for you throughout your life. And I want to talk about that first. I want to get into the fact that you lost your dad to Alzheimer's disease. And this happened two years after you released the book, Rain Brain. And I want you to just share with us how this reinforced your passion for the subject matter. <laughs> I have to say, Marnie, I wasn't, I didn't know that we'd start with that, but that's good. Here I have my dad living in a assisted living facility across the street from my medical practice. So I had the opportunity to be with him every day. And it was a very positive and powerful inspiration for me to do the best I could because I would see him in the morning and then I would walk across the parking lot and then I would see Alzheimer's patients with their families. And oftentimes families would say, oh, doc, you just can't imagine how hard it is. And I would level with them at that point and tell them, you know, as a matter of fact, look out the window. That's my dad's room right there. And so I totally understand what it's like. And that said, as we then move forward to where we are today, it really, I think, is very supportive and compelling of the mission to raise awareness that Alzheimer's is largely a preventable disease. Just a couple of weeks ago, oddly enough, in the Journal of the American Medical Association, a publication appeared by Dr. Richard Kennedy, which was a meta-analysis, in other words, a review of the 10 top research studies being carried out to look at the effectiveness of so-called Alzheimer's drugs. And this study involved close to 3,000 individuals. What they found was really uh, quite compelling, and that is that they wanted to determine how effective were the major classes of Alzheimer's drugs, drugs like Aricept and drugs like Namenda. What they found was not only were the drugs that are being sold to the tune of close to a billion dollars in America ineffective, but they actually were associated with worsening cognitive function. In other words, people taking these drugs with the idea that it would somehow keep them functional, we now know are actually speeding their cognitive decline. It's like giving a drug to somebody with high blood pressure that actually raised their blood pressure. 
I've been watching the news and reading the newspapers since the time this article was published, the study was published, and no one's talking about it. Yet we know that our lifestyle factors are hugely relevant as it relates to risk for this very disease for which there is no treatment. And, you know, certainly uh, we'll explore what those lifestyle issues are as we move forward today. But as we do move forward since the original Grain Brain publication five years ago, there has been such an explosion of research that does support the idea that our lifestyle choices, the types of foods that we eat, whether we exercise or not, whether we choose to eat various foods that may threaten our body in terms of inflammation or not, how much restful sleep do we get? These are hugely important factors as they relate to risk for this disease for which there is no treatment. And we certainly will get into a lot of these factors, but let's start with the obvious. Let's start with grain and gluten and the impact that this is having on our health and mainly our brain. It's a very good question, Marnie. And let me just phrase this first, not from a research or clinical perspective, but more from an anthropological perspective. We recognize that in almost our entire existence on this planet, in other words, during the first two million years of our time on this planet, the human brain increased in size threefold suddenly around 12,000 to 14,000 years ago. That stopped happening and really related to now from that period of time since 12 to 14,000 years ago. There has been a decline in size of the human brain for the first time in history of about 10%. What happened 12,000 years ago? Suddenly there was this dramatic shift in the foods that humans were consuming. Where we had been hunter-gatherers, suddenly we've developed agriculture, and there's this dramatic shift away from foods that were growing in nature and animals that we would find that had died or that we had killed, to a diet that was really focused on grain. And this is represented a major shift in human nutrition the most dramatic shift that has ever been recorded. And interestingly, since that time, as you've seen, there has been a progressive decline in human health. Sure, life expectancy has increased as we've become better and better at treating certain acute issues and treating trauma and reducing death around childbirth. But as you all know, for the first time in history, this past year, we've seen that the lifespan of humans in America, men and women, is now declining. So it's not as if suddenly we've changed genetically, but what we do know is that we've certainly turned the tables on major environmental factors like nutrition, like other aspects of lifestyle, like exercise, quality of our sleep. So grains entered the picture. Everybody credits our development of agriculture with our ability to explore the world because of their ability to be carried and lack of spoilage and ability that humans had then to put grain away for the winter so we could survive. And the reality is that no change in human history has been so profound with all due respect to the negative as well than has been implemented with our adaptation, adoption rather, in an agricultural-based supply for our foods. That's the macroscopic view. I think that the shift is that this is suddenly a shift away from foods higher in fat and fiber to foods that are dramatically lower in fiber, much higher in available carbohydrate, and more recently to the exclusion of dietary fat. That is a major challenge to human physiology. It represented a major challenge to our gut bacteria. And truthfully, now that we understand how food influences our DNA expression, a major what we call epigenetic challenge to human physiology, causing the expression of our DNA to increase the production of inflammatory chemicals while at the same time decreasing our body's production of its own antioxidants. And we've seen what's happened to human health uh, as a consequence of this. So that's the major shift that happened when we adopted a grain-based diet higher levels of carbs, providing humans 
the exposure to a chemical called gluten, a protein that was never part of the human diet. Now wheat products account for about 40% of what is consumed in Western cultures. You know, we see now the manifestations of that. While we're on the topic of shifting to the grain diet, a couple questions come to mind. And one being, were we consuming any grain whatsoever before that point? And secondly, how has grain evolved since that shift and we started to really consume it? How has it changed over the years? Well, have we ever consumed a grain? Yes. Grain is by definition the seeds of grass. There is evidence that we have been eating the seeds of grass to some very minimal degree for a long time. It was not the primary source of human nutrition until we learned how to cultivate it. And in that cultivation, we amped up the amount of exposure that we then were having with respect to gluten and certainly carbohydrates. Over the years, Once we learned how to grow crops, we began to cultivate crops that seemed to be working better, that would produce higher yields. And so that selected out types of grains that seemed to be easier to grow and, and as mentioned, would provide higher yields long before we even had a notion of genetic modification, which has nothing to do with hybridization or just crop selection. So over the years, humans have been domesticated by wheat. The wheat plant was very, very intelligent and crafty in allowing humans to be manipulated. Under the direction of wheat, it's now grown around the globe and serves as a primary food source, so it's spread around the globe and its seeds by making itself very attractive to human beings. Why? Because it gives us a huge carbohydrate burst And it also contains morphine-like chemicals that make us want it even more and more. The purpose of those morphine-like chemicals is so that humans and other animals will like this stuff and eat more and more of it and therefore spread its seeds around the planet. So humans were domesticated by this plant. A big question is, is this mainly a North American issue? I'm talking about presently right now. Because in cultures around the world, in Europe, people who are using more ancient practices of food preparation and harvesting grains differently, I'm just curious. I know I get this question a lot. I would love to hear your take on this in terms of, you know, places like Italy where they're not processing the wheat grain as much as maybe here in North America. So let's just have you talk about that. Like yourself, it's a question I'm asked quite frequently. You know, people say, gee, I'm I have uh, gluten sensitivity, but when I went to Italy and we ate pasta, everything seemed to be okay. And I think that there is some suggestion that the amount of gluten that they are consuming might be less. But to be sure, they're consuming gluten. There's gluten. It makes the bread rise. Wheat products contain gluten. So I think that we first have to ask ourselves, what is it about gluten that may cause issues with some people, many people, I believe, if not all people? And it has to do with what gluten does to the lining of the gut, specifically a part of gluten called alpha-gliadin, induces leakiness of the gut lining as was wonderfully demonstrated in the journal Nutrients back in 2015 by Dr. Alessio Fasano, who's now at Harvard. So somehow this alpha-gliadin molecule enhances gut lining permeability that leads to inflammation which is the cornerstone of a lot of problems, and maybe we'll have time to talk about that. But if this is indeed the mechanism uh, that we want to focus on, it's important to recognize that there are some things in the human diet that can offset this damaging effect of alpha-gliadin on the gut permeability. So diets that have higher levels of phytonutrients, that have uh, fresher ingredients, less processed ingredients, Certainly diets that are supplying higher levels of prebiotic fiber, for example, to nurture gut bacteria, one of the jobs that they have is to keep the gut lining intact. Perhaps it is that it's not necessarily the gluten that is being consumed, but rather the context in which it's being consumed. So eating white bread in America along with other low-quality nutrients might set the stage for increased gut permeability, whereas eating white bread in Italy in the presence of fresh tomatoes, higher amounts of olive oil, garlic, onions, leeks, which are rich sources of prebiotic fiber, 
might offset this effect and therefore may not be as damaging to the gut lining as it could have been. Well, one of the big changes you've made in how you're working with patients since the release of your book initially is that you're now not testing for gluten sensitivity with patients and you're assuming that everybody's sensitive and to avoid it entirely. So explain why you've had a change of heart on this. Well, I will. And I'd say that, you know, that is one of the nice things about being able to update a book. So that's why we revised Grain Brain. And, you know, based on more research that has come out since the book was originally published, Dr. Fasano has indicated that he believes that gluten induces permeability in people in general. So that said, I make the recommendation that we should all avoid gluten. Is that a draconian recommendation? Well, I think some people would see it as such. Is there ever gluten in my diet? I am sure that there is. Do I have celiac disease? No. Do I have non-celiac gluten sensitivity per se? I don't. Do I absolutely do my ultimate best to avoid gluten? Yes, I do, based upon what the science has told us, what it has revealed, getting back to my own risk for Alzheimer's by virtue of the fact that my father had that disease. I want to do everything I possibly can not to be in that situation, more so because of how that could affect my loved ones and less so because of how it would affect me. Because, you know, you get to a stage in Alzheimer's where you're really not appreciating the fact that you have this disease. I watched it happen and we know that happens. But you can be certain that it's emotionally devastating for a family and loved ones. So I do the best I can. I don't think it's fair for me to be writing books and being on your podcast, do as I say, not as I do. I think I'm called upon to set an example and I do it and I do the very best I can. And so far, I think that, you know, these ideas that we've had have been so supported. Even recently, just a last month, a very intriguing study came out from a, a Dr. Ant Vorskov from Denmark, and she has done a lot of laboratory studies showing a higher risk of type 1 autoimmune diabetes in rodents and laboratory mice whose mothers were given gluten. But she's now completed a 10-year study in pregnant women, 67,000 pregnancies followed over 10 years and determine how much gluten these women consumed during their pregnancies. These are humans. And found that those women during pregnancy who consumed the highest level of gluten, the risk of having that child become type 1 autoimmune diabetic was doubled. That study was just published. You know, as we give recommendations to women, well, you should make sure you get plenty of folic acid, keep exercising. You might want to take a DHA supplement or whatever it may be. Look at this result that shows doubling of the risk of that child, which is really what all these recommendations are about, of becoming a type 1 autoimmune diabetic if mother ate a lot of gluten during pregnancy. Published in a peer-reviewed journal. I mean, I think this is really quite important that we look at these studies as they come out and we publicize them. We raise the flag. I'm fully aware that moving forward, there may be other ideas that challenge what we've been saying, and I welcome that, and I'm going to be receptive to that. Now we're going to take a quick break from our chat with David to give a shout out to our show partner, Four Sigmatic. If there's one medicinal mushroom that is amazing for brain health, it's lion's mane. If you need to sit down and do some writing, some reading, or just have some focused energy, you got to make yourself a cup of lion's mane. And what's so beautiful about this drink is that you can just drink it on its own. You can just add a little bit of water and it tastes great by itself. It's got a little bit of peppermint and rose hips and rhodiola and a hint of stevia added to it. And it tastes delicious. And the best part is it's boosting your brain. You're going to think better. You're going to focus better. And it's going to enhance your memory. So if you don't have the lion's mane on hand at home, highly recommended. This is something that Jesse and I use on the regular. I'm either having it plain, as I stated before, or I'm putting it into an elixir. So go ahead and get your hands on the lion's mane. Lion's mane is incredible. I think it's my favorite medicinal mushroom. Definitely get your hands on some. And as a listener of our show, you get 10% off all your Four Sigmatic purchases. To take advantage, go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash Four Sigmatic. Again, that URL is ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash Four Sigmatic. For listeners in the US and Canada, you can bundle that order together, spend $100 or more, and you get free shipping. Go and load up on some lion's mane and get brain hugs all day, every day. 
And now a shout out from other show partner, Core Chair. And I've got an amazing review coming from Michelle, who's a very happy customer, and she has a core chair. Here is what she had to say. I love my core chair. I've struggled all my life with bad posture. I tried it for a couple of weeks on a demo. For the first time, I did not have a sore back at the end of the day. It has changed my life. I love how it forces you to sit properly and pay attention to sitting up straight. It is very, very comfortable. Michelle, we totally agree. Jesse and I sit on this chair every single day and certainly when we're recording a podcast and it is very, very comfortable. We love our core chairs and we know you're going to love your core chair as well. And now is the time to get one. Core chair has an incredible boxing day sale on right now till the end of the year. You get $200 off your core chair purchase and an additional discount for being a listener of our show. To take advantage of this incredible deal, go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash core chair. Again, that URL is ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash core chair. These chairs have a 60 day money back guarantee. They ship free in North America. Go and take advantage of the boxing day sale and get an amazing discount. And now back to our chat with David. Myself and Marnie, we're in the same boat as you where we haven't been tested, but as far as we know, we're not gluten sensitive, but we avoid it when we can. So We've been tossing around the terms gluten sensitivity and celiac disease. And I think before we move forward, let's define the two and talk about the differences there. I think that it's very important to differentiate between celiac disease and what is called non-celiac gluten sensitivity because they're absolutely different situations. Celiac disease has a strong inheritance risk pattern. We do know that there are some susceptibility genes that can be tested for that antibodies can be evaluated to determine if a person has celiac disease or not. It is an autoimmune condition and it is treated by a gluten-free diet. Non-celiac gluten sensitivity is, as the name would imply, unlike celiac disease, it is not an autoimmune condition. There are not genetic markers for it and it's much more a clinical diagnosis, although we are learning more and more that there may be some applicability of laboratory studies. Whereas celiac disease might affect 1.4% of the Western population, people experiencing issues with uh, non-celiac gluten sensitivity, it might be as high as 40 to 50% of people. But you don't know. You can't necessarily connect your headache to the fact that you had a gluten exposure this morning. You might not connect it until you suddenly become aware that there is this thing called non-celiac gluten sensitivity that they read about in a book. So maybe I'll give it a shot. Maybe I'll stop eating gluten for a week and chart my headache diary and see if in fact I am better or my joint pain or my skin rash or my bowel issues. The important thing to recognize about non-celiac gluten sensitivity, which is far more pervasive, is that the issues people experience may not be related to the gut. There's been this misunderstanding that if you have sensitivity to celiac disease, it's going to manifest as a gut-related issue, pain, cramping, diarrhea, etc. The point is, and it's very important, it could be headache. It could be a movement disorder. It could be a cognitive issue. It could be a mood issue. It could be joint pain or a skin issue without any involvement of the gut whatsoever. So the purpose of publicizing this, writing books about is to raise what we call the index of suspicion. So we begin to think about adding gluten to the list of possible causes of my depression, my mood issues, my cognitive issues, my brain fog, my headaches, my joint pain, my skin issues, etc. Got to leave that one on the list. It's not going to hurt anybody to go gluten-free. You know, we need to consider the cause of these problems rather than just pop everybody on a Prozac who feels depressed or load them up with non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs or worse because of their joint pain. I think that's such a valid point because gluten is often directly associated with the gut and gut issues and bloating and gas. So to be able to look at our body and some of the other symptoms we might be experiencing and that it can manifest in that way. So I really thank you for addressing that. You know, I feel like the people who get their shorts in a knot when it comes to coming or going onto a gluten-free diet if they're not celiac is probably because of the fear and the responsibility of giving that up. (laughs) They're just so afraid to give up wheat in their diet. You know, Jesse and I, again, being health leaders and living gluten-free for a couple of years, 
We get lashback all the time from people saying, well, if you're not celiac, why are you doing this? It's just so interesting that people are just so afraid to kind of take ownership of their health and maybe look at things from a different perspective, which again is why we love your book, because we're coming at this from the angle of the brain and not just the gut. I would say that probably people who are listening to your podcast right off the bat are those people who are more open-minded and wanting to improve. You know, these are very likely individuals who will give it a shot, will make the change, will use their prefrontal cortex to make these decisions as opposed to simply acting from more primitive brain centers that want to honor the sweet tooth day in and day out, eat whatever I want because I like it. I like my bagel. I like my croissant, whatever it is. Who wouldn't? We would all like to eat those foods because they appeal to us. There are these chemicals in wheat products that are addictive. And there are, uh, you know, the addictive nature of simple carbohydrates and sugar, of course. But we are gifted by the ability to think about our life choices and make changes if we cultivate our relationship to that part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, to have accessibility to it. And interestingly, the more we are inflamed, the higher level of inflammation in our bodies from eating things like gluten, from having higher blood sugar, for example, the less able we are to access that more sophisticated part of the brain that allows better decision-making and the more we act impulsively and eat the wrong foods and decide not to exercise. And what you're saying is very true and it was true for me. It was an evolution. I was eating ancient grains for many years, spelt, kamut, and I was convinced that you know if they're ancient, then they're good. And as I did more learning using my frontal cortex and understanding and paying attention to my body, I went to gluten-free, and now Jesse and I are in a place where we're grain-free, which brings me to the topic of grain-free and expanding on this. Do people need to just go grain-free as opposed to just gluten-free? Let's just make that differentiation because I think a lot of people might be listening to this thinking, okay, I need to come off wheat. I'm going to go gluten-free. So let's just talk about grain-free. I will. And you know, there's some wonderful cookbooks out there. Daniel Walker, I think, has written some beautiful cookbooks on going against the grain, as it were. I think that by and large, you have to understand that while a lot of grain is containing gluten, the wheat, barley, rye, etc., grain in and of itself is a pretty high concentrated source of carbs anyway. So that said, you know, if you want to be in a position where you're more likely to be in ketosis and not burning carbohydrates as a fuel, that's a very good argument against having grains of even the non-gluten grains on the plate. We're hearing quite a bit of information these days about arsenic levels in rice. So there's, I think, a pretty good argument against eating a lot of rice. I think that if you're careful about the amount of those non-gluten and hopefully organic grains that you may choose to consume, careful in terms of portion size, just thinking about the carbohydrate load, then it's not as critical, in my opinion, to avoid them as it is to avoid those that do contain gluten. But again, the subtitle of Grain Brain is The Surprising Truth About Wheat, Carbs, and Sugar, Your Brain's Silent Killers. So even though grains are not wheat, they are the seeds of grass, they are still a powerful concentration of carbohydrates, which ultimately does raise blood sugar despite the fiber. And I think by and large, it may not be the best choice for a food uh, in any significant quantity. And in the book, you actually state that they're just as harmful having carbs as eating a gluten-laden diet. So if you could just expand upon that a bit. There's an old saying, when you're doing one thing, you're not doing another. And if you choose to eat these foods, then you're not going to have foods that are going to deliver to you, for example, the type of fiber that you need to nurture your gut bacteria. So you're not going to be having good levels of prebiotic fiber. As mentioned, you're going to have a pretty good surge in blood sugar. That is critical. To say which is worse, I can't. You know, both are significant issues. And certainly in our world, I believe that people are becoming much more aware of the notion of insulin signaling and insulin resistance and the whole blood sugar connection to chronic degenerative disease. So it does provide a pretty powerful argument against grains in general, I think, as being a very, very big issue. That said, we're seeing highly processed flour of various types of grains and other sources being recommended in recipe books, you got to understand that the processing of these 
grains and to a certain degree uh, nuts and other sources of flour does increase their ability to raise blood sugar pretty aggressively. So I think you have to think about that. The more simple the foods are, A, is a powerful argument, and B, in the more plant-based as opposed to seed-based and grain being a seed, I think is where we're going moving forward. And as you touched on earlier too, the fact that these carbs are going to kick us out of or not allow us to get into ketosis as well. And that becomes you know, a big topic in and of itself. And absolutely uh, consuming non-gluten containing grains and or other sources of carbohydrates will work against you if your goal is to get into ketosis. And I think that is an important goal. We do see a lot of literature as of late that indicates cycling in and out of ketosis may well be an even more salubrious approach to diet, but that doesn't mean, for example, eating a lot of protein, especially animal protein. There are some downsides of that as well. But I think moving more towards a plant-based diet, my opinion, is a good thing to do if those individuals who want to eat meat want to continue that. I think, you know, make the choice for grass-fed maybe relegate meat to being not the focus of the meal, but to being the side dish or the garnish. It's a bit of a shift. You know, you look at the plate and suddenly it's not there. You know, you go to a restaurant or an event and they say, well, are you going to have the fish or are you going to have the steak or the chicken? I mean, that's the focus of the menu, isn't it? You know, to say, well, I think I'm just going to have a couple orders of sautéed spinach, some asparagus. I'd like to start with a kale salad and do it like that. It raises eyebrows, but then maybe I'll have a taste of your grass-fed beef if that's a possibility. It's just a different approach. But I think that moving away from the notion that filet mignon is the centerpiece of the meal, I think makes a heck of a lot of sense. Well, while we're on the topic of eating out, I'm curious on the effect of consuming gluten, say periodically, if you're eating dinner out on the weekends, or if you're going to friends' houses and just having, quote unquote, a little bit of gluten here and there, what's the impact on the gut and overall health? I think it gets back to our discussion earlier. I mean, it's sort of like carbon credits. Can you offset that effect by having an otherwise really good diet with lots of prebiotic fiber, lots of phytonutrients in it? I tend to think the answer is yes. I know darn well that when I go to somebody's house and there's some sauce on the whatever, that maybe it might contain gluten. As I mentioned earlier, I'm certain there's gluten entering into my diet at times. Not at home and not at certain restaurants that we go to that clearly pay attention to that. So I think it probably for people without celiac is a question more of degree than of kind. For people with celiac disease, even microscopic amounts are really threatening for all of the complications associated with celiac disease. So For the rest of us, again, do your very, very best. I wouldn't not go to somebody's house because you're unsure. If you eat at home most of the time and then go out and see what other people eat. I've never eaten a meal with you guys, but I assume we probably eat in a very similar way. It's very surprising what people consume in terms of what they think is good food. Totally. And that's why I always offer to bring something over. (laughs) Maybe two things (laughs) that way we're covered. But while we're on the subject of maybe intermittent gluten, I think we should talk about the non-food sources that can be found that maybe people aren't thinking of. So maybe if you just want to go through a couple of these. Oh, sure. Well, I think one of the biggest issues that people don't understand is there's gluten in many pharmaceuticals. Can you imagine gluten uh, used in the production of pharmaceuticals, certainly cosmetics? So our exposure is far more likely to happen in these areas that we don't consider. So I think that, you know, that's what we did in Grain Brain and we feature that in the revision as well. A real review of so many of the places that we may be exposed to gluten and have no clue. I want to get into blood sugar. I know we talked a little bit about the carbs and the impact on blood sugar, but let's talk about the impact specifically on cognitive decline and how that's playing a role and how we're thinking, how we're feeling and how our brain is functioning. That's a really good idea because we have to relate blood sugar and its elevation to the notion of inflammation. And that occurs through a variety of mechanisms. So blood sugar, oddly enough, as strange as it may seem, reflects our food choices. Who knew? Each sugar, blood sugar goes up, 
The next dot we connect is the dot to inflammation. One of the most common things to consider is a process called glycation, where the elevation of the blood sugar binds to proteins, a process called glycation, and changes the shape of these proteins such that our immune system begins to be a little bit irritated by that, and there are higher and higher levels of chemicals involved in the inflammatory cascade that we call cytokines. So this is the dot connection that relates food choices, blood sugar, glycation, inflammation, the cornerstone mechanistically of brain degeneration that we ultimately call Alzheimer's disease. Type 2 diabetics have about a four-fold increased risk for the development of Alzheimer's disease, a disease for which there is no treatment. So anything that relates to increasing a person's risk for diabetes, I think, is something that we should certainly consider because of this connection to Alzheimer's risk. So let's just get back to inflammation for a moment. There was a really amazing study published in the well-respected journal Neurology back in 2017. This is a study that looked at about 1,600 individuals many, many years ago, followed them for 24 years. And what they did at the beginning of the study, 24 years prior to when they reconnected with these people, They did a simple blood test to measure inflammatory markers. Then they ranked these individuals with respect to, did they have high levels of inflammatory markers or low levels? 24 years later, they determined out of this group of 1,600 people who developed dementia or who developed shrinkage of the brain and had memory issues, more importantly. And they found that those individuals 24 years before who had the higher levels of inflammatory markers in their blood had a much higher risk of having troubles with episodic memory and actually had brain shrinkage in direct proportion to the the degree of elevation of these markers of inflammation that they found in their blood. Uh, Similarly, another study demonstrated that having just a large belly translates to increased risk of dementia 34 years later. Think about that. Why that's important is because today our discussion of Alzheimer's disease and its treatment, et cetera, really is dealing with the elderly population who is now manifesting the situation. But what we're now learning is that being obese or having high levels of inflammatory markers and as you both well know, those go hand in hand. These are powerful risk markers for developing dementia 24 and 30 years down the line. And that means we're talking about 30-year-old people and 40-year-old people who really are not kind of dialed into this issue, even thinking about Alzheimer's disease, but they should be. Because these are studies now that are telling us that what you do at that part of your life is going to manifest when you're older, 25, 30 years down the line. So this is the audience that needs our attention right now in terms of getting this message to lower your carbs, increase your dietary fat, get yourself a new pair of sneakers, and make sure you're getting a good quality sleep, for example, because these factors play into whether you have a big belly, whether you have high levels of inflammatory markers, what your risk is and will be in terms of diabetes. Again, a fourfold increased risk of Alzheimer's imparted by that disease. And tying the big belly back to our previous conversation on carbs, we know that carbs are a primary cause of weight gain. So everything is tied in together here. Absolutely. No mystery. I mean, this was, as I mentioned, this major shift that happened in human nutrition when we developed agriculture. The point is, that it's not that Dr. Perlmutter is on your show today making these statements because I believe this stuff. The point is, this is what our most well-respected, peer-reviewed science is telling us. Fortunately, you know, for the grace of God that there are programs like yours, then people can hear this information, read a book like I've written, they get this information, but by and large, this is not part of the public discourse. You know, again, what we are told in Western cultures is pretty much do whatever you want, live your life however you choose, because modern science is going to develop a magic pill for you to take care of all of your ills. You know, as it relates 
in this case to Alzheimer's, we don't have such a pill. It doesn't exist. And yet your lifestyle choices can help you not end up on the wrong side of that diagnosis. Now we're going to take another quick break from our chat with David to give a shout out to our show partner, Sun Warrior. You're going to want to have some Ormus Super Greens on hand. I'm sure over the holidays you've been eating lots of food and you're going to need an awesome way to detox and cleanse. And what better way to do that than to have a little bit of Ormus Super Greens in your morning water. Feel free to take a day and just drink Super Greens all day long and just give your body and digestion a break. The Ormus Super Greens is complete with all kinds of different greens and minerals. It tastes great. I recommend getting the peppermint flavor. It's really soothing on the digestive tract. So if you haven't tried Orma Super Greens yet, give them a go. You're going to love them. And as a listener of our show, you get 10% off all your Sun Warrior purchases. To take advantage, go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash SW. Again, that URL is ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash SW. If you're listening to the show in the US or Canada, you can bundle your order together, spend $100 or more, and you get free shipping. We can't get enough of the Orma Super Greens, and we know you'll feel the same way too. I love being able to share some of the reviews that we get. Jesse and I are getting these on a weekly basis, and they make us so happy. So here is one of our recent reviews. It's called Excellent Interviewers. We were given five stars by Kay Mitko. Jesse and Marnie are some of the best interviewers I've listened to. Upon stumbling on this podcast, I found myself quickly going back, and I've listened to almost every single episode. They offer a wide array of topics, and wow, their show notes are impeccable and the best I've seen. It's so nice to be able to access every time they're referenced in the notes as a link. Thank you so much for this feedback. We take pride in our show notes and the way we organize our shows and how we interview. So thank you for this incredible feedback and thank you for the review. Thank you so much for those kind words. We really appreciate it. And exciting news, Marnie and I have a brand new webpage on our site and it has two amazing graphics that explain how to leave a review if you haven't done so already. So we had our graphic designer make these up for us. They look beautiful and they're really easy to follow. So it's super easy to leave a review. To check those out and leave us a review, go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash review. Again, that URL is ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash review. Thank you for taking the time to go and review the show. We really appreciate it. And now back to our chat with David. So I want to shift the conversation from carbs into cholesterol because we've talked a lot about fat on the podcast. I don't think we need to go into why eating good, healthy dietary fats can benefit us and the brain, but cholesterol is still the confusing one. And I know you talk about, and you say this in the book, how carbs, not cholesterol, cause high cholesterol. We've just addressed the carbs. Now let's talk about the cholesterol and how We need to really focus on the good forms of it, why it's actually beneficial, how it helps our brain function, and I'll let you go with that. Okay. (laughs) I'm queuing up the tape, right? (laughs) It is such a misunderstood concept that, you know, the whole cholesterol thing has been manipulated with all due respect by the pharmaceutical industry to create fear in people. A, create the fear, and B, create the way out of the fear by an action. What is the action? Taking a statin drug. With all due respect, there isn't a bad form and a good form of cholesterol. That's something that Madison Avenue developed so that we would think about the use of drugs to lower LDL and to raise HDL if that were the goal. Those aren't bad and good anything. They are part of your body's lipid functionality and do great things. We need the so-called bad cholesterol to carry various types of fats to various parts of our body. It's very important. We highly depend on LDL. So LDL is not bad cholesterol. It is low density lipoprotein. It is a protein. There is no bad or good cholesterol. Cholesterol is one thing and it's vitally important for brain health. It's vitally important for immune function and vitally important for the membranes that surround each and every one of our cells. We need cholesterol to make vitamin D. It's how the sun allows us to make vitamin D. Cholesterol is the chemical from which all of our sex hormones are manufactured, and even cortisol for that matter. So cholesterol is our friend. We love cholesterol. We couldn't sustain life without it. It's an antioxidant, for example, for the brain. So this castigation of cholesterol, I think it's unfair. I love my cholesterol. It keeps me functional. 
you know, the war on cholesterol being waged by statin drugs. You know, you come in with a mild elevation of cholesterol, next thing you know, you're taking a statin drug willy-nilly. I mean, there was a move for a little while to make statin drugs over the counter in England, but we have to look at the risk benefit. So we lower our cholesterol, very low cholesterol levels right off the bat are associated with higher risk of depression, higher risk of dementia as well. And I think we are, when I say we, I mean, Western science is so overzealous with reference to this cholesterol issue. We've got to understand, for example, that women taking a cholesterol statin drug as published in the Journal of the American Medical Association a study of 162,000 women, women taking statin drugs to lower their cholesterol, had a 71% increased risk of type 2 diabetes, quadrupling their risk for Alzheimer's disease, up to quadrupling, as much as quadrupling. Men taking a statin drug have a 46% increased risk of developing type 2 diabetes. Oh, and then you get to take more drugs. You get to take a sulfonylurea and you get to take metformin and all the other players. So now you've, just like so many in North America, you're just adding drug after drug to your medicine cabinet. And you know we know that there are downsides to these drugs individually and certainly synergistically or when they work together. We're extremely short-sighted and I really think the notion of Hippocrates telling us, above all, do no harm, really needs to be reconsidered in this discussion that if you're using a drug, and maybe you need to, maybe you have familial hypercholesterolemia, that you should consider all of the ramifications of that drug. And hey, with diabetes certainly being one of those ramifications. So I welcome high cholesterol foods to the table. I eat eggs very frequently. Do you remember there was a day when it used to be you would never eat an egg because something horrible would happen to you, you know? And to this day, on menus in restaurants, if you're there for breakfast, they have egg white omelets because you don't want to eat the yolk because that's where all the cholesterol lives. My goodness. Well, yeah, it is. And I love to eat my cholesterol. And as a matter of fact, it's yellow because of the carotenoids, which are going to be good for me as well. You know, it just takes some deep breaths and some dedication to looking at what the science is telling us, even though perhaps it's a little bit contrary to what your belief system may have given you over the years. Yes, these foods that happen to have cholesterol in them happen to be pretty good for you. And you share a story in the book where people with the highest cholesterol levels actually scored higher on cognitive tests than people with lower levels. So I'd just love for you to share the specifics of how cholesterol is benefiting the brain. So cholesterol is good for the brain for multiple reasons. Number one on our list will be vitamin D. It turns out that vitamin D, we think, is a good vitamin because it's good for strong bones. That's why milk was enriched with vitamin D in the day, et cetera, because people were not getting enough sunshine anymore, and therefore their vitamin D levels were going low, and therefore that's why that happened. Well, why would vitamin D levels be so darn low? Well, one reason is we're not running around naked all the time. And I'm not necessarily advocating that we do. But our ancestors, not that long ago, got plenty of sunshine, had diets that would, which were rich in cholesterol, and as such would be able to convert that cholesterol into vitamin D, which turns out to be very, very important for brain health. Higher risk of Alzheimer's, higher risk of autism, higher risk of Parkinson, all associated with lower levels of vitamin D. There are approximately 900 different receptors for vitamin D in the human body, and most of these are represented in the brain. So we call it vitamin D, we call it a vitamin, but the reality is it's much more of a hormone, especially in light of the fact that it's derived from cholesterol. Second, cholesterol in the brain sacrifices itself and can become oxidized. As such, it is an antioxidant. So it provides antioxidant protection for the brain. Third, cholesterol is a critical part of the cell membrane. And as such, the brain, which is 70% fat to start off with, has a lot of cholesterol in it because its cells are lined with cholesterol. It makes the lining of brain cells 
very fluid, very able to perform the tasks of the cell membrane, which allows the cell to be responsive to signals. So just that activity, I mean, everybody's familiar with the transmission of information across what's called the synaptic gap, where one brain cell connects to the next brain cell. That is facilitated when those membranes that line the synaptic cleft or the space between the brain cells, when there's adequate amounts of good cholesterol available to allow that process to occur. So I think these are important reasons. You know, I mentioned earlier that cholesterol is a building block from which we make testosterone, progesterone, estrogen. And these, while we consider them to be related to sexuality, sexual function, progesterone, the development of a fetus, etc., there are receptors for these what are called sex hormones, misnomer, throughout the body, throughout the brain, where they play important roles in regulating brain activity far apart from reproduction. So there are many things that are involved in why cholesterol should be your friend and arguably why lowering cholesterol with a statin drug is something we should consider threatening. I mentioned a moment ago the increased risk of diabetes from those statin drugs. We also know that the way that these statin drugs work, they inhibit a specific enzyme called HMG-CoA reductase, if you want to put that on the quiz, but they inhibit an enzyme that has another job. What this enzyme also does in human physiology is it's the enzyme that is involved in the creation of something called coenzyme Q10, which happens to be critically important in our physiology for two reasons. It is an antioxidant, and it is also a part of the mechanism within every cell that It has to do with how we create energy from the food that we eat. So when we inhibit that, we are inhibiting the energetics of brain cells, of cells throughout the body, and we are also compromising our body's antioxidant system, our body's ability to quench those damaging free radicals. So that's pretty much a short overview of the beauty of cholesterol and why we love it so. Well, thank you for that. And I want to get into some supplements, and specifically one supplement that I know that you're loving right now. But just a quick overview, there's things like curcumin, DHA, MCT, B-complex, but the one you're loving right now is whole coffee fruit extract or concentrate. Can you explain what this is and why you're loving it so much? Well, I'd be delighted. So for years, coffee makers have been making our coffee from what is called the coffee bean. And I never really gave it much thought, but coffee doesn't come from beans. So a coffee comes from a berry, which, you know, we're thinking, I want give me my coffee beans. But the reality is that it comes from this fruit, coffee fruit. And the coffee fruit has within it a seed. And that seed is then taken from the fruit and then is dried, and then ultimately, that is what we call a coffee bean. But the reality is that it comes from this fruit, and as such, there is this byproduct of the rest of the fruit, the pulp. And researchers were looking at what could this do? You know, is there any possible activity that this may have? And researchers put it through various tests and realized that this specific extract was demonstrated in cell culture to amplify the amount of BDNF, and I'll get to that in a moment, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, actually in animals, not in cell culture, and applied this research then to humans and found that this coffee extract from the fruit was able to amplify the production in humans of a chemical that stimulates the growth of new brain cells, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, quite dramatically, 142% increase production of BDNF when subjects were given this extract from the whole coffee fruit. So we added then this whole coffee fruit concentrate to the list of other ideas and products that are known to increase the production in humans of BDNF, allowing them to grow new brain cells. Why are we interested in this? Because BDNF 
is shown to correlate with risk for dementia. Higher levels of BDNF are associated with lower risk of dementia. BDNF allows the growth of new brain cells and also stimulates the connection of brain cells, a process that we call neuroplasticity. So we really want to do everything we can to increase brain-derived neurotrophic factor. So that's where this whole coffee fruit concentrate fit in really nicely with our recommendations. To that list, we add turmeric. We add DHA, the omega-3, generally from fish oil. New research actually shows that CBD, cannabidiol, increases BDNF in humans. But by far and away, I think, you know, if people want to ask what is the best supplement you can use to increase BDNF, I would say it's a supplement that's called physical exercise. So the BDNF story as it relates to whole coffee fruit, I think is emerging. I think it's very, very exciting. I know that one of my colleagues, Dr. Dale Bredesen, who has written a book called The End of Alzheimer's, is using whole coffee fruit concentrate in his protocols, which is really very, very exciting, along with exercise, ketogenic diet, improving sleep hygiene, reducing stress, optimizing vitamin D, reducing homocysteine, et cetera. The more we learn about this whole coffee fruit concentrate, I think the more exciting it's going to become. I'm glad you brought up the whole exercise thing because that's where I was going next. And yeah, this is something we can do that's free. It's easy. And I'm just curious, when you recommend exercise, are we talking aerobic exercise here or resistance training or a combo of both? You're going to probably be surprised of my inability to specifically answer that question, but we're hearing research from all over the various camps about resistance, about interval training, about you know the amount of aerobics that we do, about targeting heart rate, et cetera. And I think that by and large, what we see is that exercise is good. I think that most of the research is indicating that it should be aerobic. We could talk about targeting heart rate, et cetera, but I think that in terms of the amount of that exercise, I think that the studies have shown that the minimum is 20 minutes a day. At least that's the work that was done by Dr. Erickson at University of Pittsburgh in collaboration with UCLA. That's the study that demonstrated increased size of the brain's memory center, higher levels of BDNF, and actually increased memory performance. But there's absolutely nothing wrong with interval training. I think that strength training and resistance exercise is extremely important as well for maintaining a lean muscle mass and also for maintaining health in general. There was actually a study that I have not fully reviewed yet, but came out today indicating that there's a perfect correlation between longevity and the amount of exercise that a person gets that is in my inbox. I haven't even opened it yet. That's just from reading the abstract. So that came out today. So I think that if people are going to engage exercise and want to know what is the recommendation, I think it should be a combination of stretching to help reduce injury, to help maintain flexibility, to help reduce injury, resistance exercise to maintain strength, and also to engage, most importantly, in aerobics. This needs to be individualized. I think it's good to monitor your heart rate when you're involved in aerobics. It's difficult to tell people what they should target. It depends on various factors, but as a very, very crude estimate, I'd say everyone should target a heart rate of 180 minus your age. People taking a beta blocker, a drug that slows the heart rate, will have a hard time getting to that level. Other people are in really good shape and their target heart rate should be higher. So it's something that you know you want to work with a healthcare professional to figure out what's best for you. But I think that's a zone that is good to maintain during your aerobic exercise. While you're doing it, think about the fact that you're helping your brain. You're helping increase your resistance to Alzheimer's disease. That's some great information there. And David, before we let you go, we've talked a lot about different things that could negatively impact the brain. And I just want to leave the listeners with a little bit of positivity there for people that maybe haven't been living a healthy lifestyle and eating the way we talked about. Is there hope for the brain if it's been through a lot of trauma over the years and it's been beat up through lifestyle and diet? What kind of hope can we give these people that there is a turnaround point and there's still hope? In a word, absolutely, without a doubt. We're seeing, gosh, dietary interventions now that are curing 
type 2 diabetes. That's huge. The people who become a type 2 diabetic because of their dietary indiscretions over the years, now they have elevated blood sugar, insulin resistance, a work by Dr. Sarah Hallberg. I've interviewed her on my podcast showing that these people can come off their medications and develop normal blood sugars and normal A1Cs. Dr. Bredesen, we mentioned his work earlier. He's just reported 100 cases of actually improving the cognitive function in patients diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease by making lifestyle changes. We know that the gut bacteria that may be really mixed up based upon people's food choices can be dramatically shifted in as little as three days. So every journey begins with the first step. There's no need to look back. There's only a need to look forward and plan for the future. That's a function of the prefrontal cortex. And that's my mission. It's why we just published Grain Brain again. We revised it just to give people the tools and the encouragement to absolutely make this happen. It's absolutely never too late. Well, we definitely recommend our listeners get a copy of this revised version of Grain Brain. It's excellent. Such a great book to have on the shelf. And other than getting the book, where is a great resource for our listeners to connect with you? Let me say it shouldn't be on the shelf. <laughs> it should be on, in your lap. <laughs> That's a better place for it. You're right. It should be. After you've read it, keep it on the shelf so you can keep referring to it there is what I meant. <laughs> <laughs> I blog almost every day at drperlmutter.com, drperlmutter.com. And that's a great place to get my weekly free newsletter. I have Facebook. I do as well, David Perlmutter MD, Instagram, David Perlmutter. And that's what I do. The best thing I'd recommend for people to do is a couple of things. On the website, drperlmutter.com, we have focus areas where we compile a lot of information about things like ketogenic diet, gluten-free living, choosing low glycemic index foods, et cetera. That's a great place. The new revised Grain Brain also just really sets the stage for making these very, very important changes. All right, David, we're going to link everything up over at ultimatehealthpodcast.com so the listeners can go there and get links to everything you just mentioned. And we just want to thank you for coming on the show. This has been super informative, a great conversation, and keep doing great work in the world. Well, thank you to both of you, and I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We hope you enjoyed today's episode with David Perlmutter, and hopefully we didn't mess up your Christmas dinner plans. Maybe you had some kind of grain meal or gluten meal all planned out, and now you're having second thoughts. That's the goal of the show, to give you second thoughts. Think twice about the gluten you're putting in your body, but at the very least, enjoy Christmas. And let us know what you think over on Instagram. You can let us know and tag Ultima Health Podcast and David Perlmutter. We hope you took some great tips away from today's episode. For full show notes, be sure and head over to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash 273. We have links there to everything we discussed and a nice show summary. Be sure and check that out. And before we let you guys go, I want to give some love to our editor and engineer, Jay Sanderson over at podcasttech.com. Jace, thanks for doing such a great job putting the show together. And this week's fun fact about Jace is actually not a fun fact. It's a message from him. And he hopes you have the best Christmas and that Santa brings you all the gifts you've been dreaming about. Merry Christmas from Marnie and I as well. Hope you had a fantastic day. We'll talk to you soon. Take care.